Welcome to Rehash. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Rehash, a Web3 podcast. I'm your host, Diana Chen. And today we're speaking with two very special guests, Sarah Mayojas and Mitchell Chan, two conceptual artists that I really admire and have interviewed individually in the past, Sarah about a year ago and Mitchell all the way back in the fall of 2021, which I think was at the peak or near the peak of the NFT hype. So we're in very different mood and vibe today when we're recording this, but I'm so happy to have both of them on. You might know Sarah from some of her projects like Bitcoin, Speculations, stock performance, non-existent token, and you might know Mitchell from some of his projects like IKB or Digital Zones, the LeWitt Generator or Beggar's Belief. Sarah and Mitchell were nominated by Diana Chen, me, and voted onto the podcast by Christina Beltramini, Dame, Ninty Nick, Nitch, Ane, Spencer Graham, Jonathan Mann, and myself. Before we dive into our conversation, here's a quick word from the Web3 projects that helped make this season possible. Social media wasn't designed for ads and algorithms. It was made for people. And at Lens Protocol, we're putting people back in control. We're not looking for users' data. We're here to build a community of collaborators, builders, artists, and dreamers, ready to unlock a new world of social media. This isn't just an app. It's a flourishing ecosystem of platforms and experiences owned and operated by the developers and creators who are bringing it to life. In the Lensverse, you don't just own your content. You own everything. Your data, your connections, the value you bring to the table, it all stays in your possession, exactly where it should be. As a creator, the Lens ecosystem offers a new set of tools for connecting with your audience. Your data is truly portable and belongs to you. Post once and distribute everywhere in the Lensverse. You can even take your followers with you from app to app. As a developer, you can skip right past building the base layers and scaling your users by plugging your new app directly into Lens's existing infrastructure and community. So whether you create with a brush or a camera, sound waves or lines of code, it's time you got your due. Come create the future of social media with us on Lens Protocol. Lens is the last social media handle you'll ever need. Have you seen how epic Ambire Wallet is? How epic it is? Yeah, cue the music. Ambire is a Web3 wallet that makes crypto self-custody easy and secure for everyone. Instead of relying on clunky seed phrases, you can create an account with the hardware wallet or username and password, secure it with two-factor authentication, and regain access with Ambire's cloud recovery. Need to pay out some contributors or execute a bunch of trades? No problem, chief. Queue up as many transactions as you want, and when you're ready, execute the entire batch at the same time, paying gas only once. You can even prepay for gas with stable coins or Ambire's native wallet token, which will get you some cash back. Without ever leaving the Ambire interface, you can manage assets from over a dozen chains, safely migrate them with Ambire's built-in bridge, and seamlessly interact with dApps like Uniswap, Aave, and Snapshot, all within the same transaction. Plus, Ambire is constantly growing their dApp catalog with trusted partners and collaborating with builders who want to establish the new standard for smart contract wallets. So, pretty epic, huh? Yeah, I already know all that though. I've had an Ambire wallet for months. And you didn't tell me? You never asked. To get involved and truly own your assets, go to ambire.com. How was your day? Bad. What happened? I bought some NFTs and then they just disappeared. (gasps) Sounds like your NFT creator should have used NFT.storage. NFT.what? NFT.storage. Come on, I'll show you. With NFT.storage, anyone can easily upload their NFT data to a decentralized and reliable storage network completely for free. Wow. How does it work? Well, Instead of relying on centralized and impermanent storage solutions, NFT.Storage uploads your files to IPFS and Filecoin. These are powerful peer-to-peer networks that are made for the decentralized web. Thanks to IPFS's unique storage system, you can be confident that once your files are uploaded, they'll be accessible from anywhere in the world for as long as you'd like. They're already trusted by some of the biggest names in Web3, like OpenSea, Magic Eden, and Rarible. By adding files to these networks for free, NFT.Storage is helping to turn proper NFT data management into a public good. This will ensure that NFTs will remain accessible and secure in the long run, so you won't get rugged again. 
G. So I just upload my files and nft.storage will take care of the rest? Now you're getting it. Go to nft.storage today to upload some NFT data of your own for free. And be sure to follow nft.storage on Twitter at nftdotstorage. So without further ado, here are our guests, Sarah and Mitchell. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Hi. Hi. I know we've already had like a 30-minute conversation, so it feels awkward to restart the conversation now. But thank you so much. Hopefully, we can find a way to build in our hot takes about the Oscars into this conversation somehow. But I want to start off by asking you, Mitchell, about some of your hot takes about conceptual art. So for starters, could you tell us what you consider to be conceptual art and what you consider to very much not be conceptual art? Sure. As with all sort of taxonomies of ideas, and particularly of art, these definitions are useful only to a degree. And there's blurriness, of course. But in general, I think that we can say that, you know, a conceptual artwork is a piece where, you know, the artwork proper, the object or the image or whatever, really exists as a placeholder to point the viewer to some object outside of it. All right. But not only that, because you could say that is true of a lot of art. You could say that Renaissance painting exists to point the viewer to the larger concept of God and, and, and Catholicism or whatever, right? But it is artwork that explicitly wants to make that external thing. Usually a process or a system that is used in the making of the artwork, the artwork wants to point to that as the real focus, as the true subject, the true content of the artwork. And so, you know, I was in the JPEG Discord because they have, I think, like the best Discord, you know, going right now for people in Web3 who are like interested in actually like talking about art. And these canons end up being a framework for people to have these, you know, the fun conversations, silly, intellectual, whatever. And, you know, we just want to make some clear distinctions that it's not about, you know, because you, you know, make a, a drawing and you say, well, but my, my drawing is actually about these feelings that I have that are like elsewhere, not in the artwork and saying, well, according to the sort of tradition of conceptual art, that's just, it's fine. You maybe you, you, you made something nice, but it's not that definition proper. So can something be conceptually interesting and engaging and not be considered conceptual art? The answer is most things. The answer is most things are conceptually interesting. We, we talking about movies that I have seen are conceptually interesting. I like to I, I like to think about the ideas in this movie. I just watched I just watched the finale of The Last of Us. I like to think about concepts of protection and parenting that come out of that movie. While well, that piece is decidedly not a piece of conceptual art, right? Uh, in that it did not intentionally forego a more durable or tangible or traditional medium in favor of the medium of pure idea. So it's fine. Many things are good and smart and well executed and look nice without being art. And many things are thought provoking without being conceptual art. And this is fine. Yeah. Do you agree with that, Sarah? Yeah, I think that also conceptual art didn't really exist before the 20th century. And for most of the history of art, art you know, as Mitchell said, was religious art. Art and religion were just so inextricably linked. And the 20th century saw that separation take place. And so the 20th century also is where we had so many different art movements in such a quick succession. And that also didn't happen before, right? You had all of these isms like surrealism and Dadaism and postmodernism and like, et cetera, et cetera. And so a lot of those were exercises in expanding the definition of what art could be, right? Till all the boundaries were really broken, right? Art could be you know, there's fluxus, right? Like art could be anything. Art could be words. Art could be dance. Art could be sound. Art could be, you know, so a lot of historically the con conceptual art was being used to expand the definition of what art could be. And in a sense, like that's 
one of the threads, right, that came into some of my work, right, with like Bitcoin or even stock performance is like expanding again, you know, a token can be art. And <laughs> like the manipulation of a stock can be art, right, and building a project from there. But that's, I think, where conceptual art really starts. And why it's also tricky nowadays, because we've expanded the definition of art, right? At that point, that operation is complete. So to make conceptual art nowadays, I think is changing shape and also going to perhaps in relationship to AI and AI becoming so like, it's so possible to create any sort of imagery, right? And so to designate something as art, like I think actually conceptual art may become a lot more important as a way of like establishing value in a certain creation since you know visually we're going to have so much undifferentiated imagery that is amazing to behold yeah okay so let's just jump ahead for a second and talk about ai because you brought that up and i i'm really curious i was actually just having a conversation with a musician about like how does ai change the realm of work for DJs and for musicians in general, and whether AI makes art less authentic than it should be. And the thinking behind that is like, you know, like the art that you create, whether you're a visual artist or a musician or anything should come from your heart, from how you feel the experiences that you've had. And by replacing a lot of those elements with AI, maybe we're taking away from that full experience. What's your take on that? Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot. So there are two considerations. One is that, and like Mitch, I think would agree with this because he's also an artist. Like when you make something, you don't really know. It's not like you have an idea and that idea is the final product, right? There are steps along the way where things change and you get to something that you didn't expect. And so a lot of times when I hear people talking about AI and how it can enable creators, they really talk as if the idea and the outcome, it's just a question of getting to the outcome fast enough. Like, oh, you know, wouldn't it be great if the image that you had in your mind was suddenly there in front of you? Like we're helping creators, you know, get closer to the outcome. So, And it's like, that's not how creation works. Creation, like, is very incremental and and like chance and other influences and time like all of these things matter in terms of creating something so that's like one point but i think the more important point is the question of authorship becomes really inevitable in the sense that you know painting as a medium has really had such a stronghold on the history of art because as a medium, it is so well-suited to making art, right? And it is well-suited to authorship as well because there is such an infinite possibility of outcomes of paint and canvas. And also that outcome is extremely linked and tied to the individual producing that. Whereas With AI, yes, there is like an infinity of outcomes, but the link to the individual is at this point mostly like a string of words and so much chance and randomness and like the model itself comes into the authorship of that image that your claim as an auteur is inevitably less and all mediums allow people to have a claim on authorship right so like photography has a less of a claim than painting right because photography as a photographer you are liaising with reality with the world with what's going on and like that magic moment that was captured how much of that was you happening you know you were just lucky in the right moment and how much of it was you know you really creating it you know so that claim is a little bit less. Another thing I love is like marbling, like liquid marbling on paper. You could become an amazing craftsperson at doing it, but becoming an auteur of it is not possible because you are always bound by the physics of like these droplets that move in a way that you can't totally control. So I do think that it's an amazing tool, but it really impacts like the claim on authorship that humans can have. 
I love that take. Mitchell, what do you think? Look, I totally agree with what Sarah said, especially the stuff at the beginning. I think that the question about authorship, we can kind of leave that alone because I think that that's, it's trickier and not quite as black as white as some of the earlier things that Sarah was saying. And I think that the question of authorship is, we don't even need to invoke that to talk about some of the difficulties, right? So the first thing that Sarah said was, Conceptual artwork, which we started off talking about, where we say the idea is the artwork. No, it's, it's just like Sarah said. It's not like we said, oh, we have an idea and they're done, right? It's like the reason why it has to be a conceptual artwork and not just a concept is because you bring something into the world and then it's, it's not done. Like that's a conversation, right? Like I make art to express ideas that I couldn't think about in other ways. If I could just write the idea down on a piece of paper, I would be done. I would do that. I would be done. That would be much more efficient. It'd be a much better use of my time. When you make an artwork, it is in dialogue and I make it so that ultimately it can change my idea, right? And that those two things can be in dialogue with each other. Like it's a, it's a tool for that. So I think that that is, yeah, very important that creation is iterative. It is a dialogue between the artist and the creative thing. It is not like, I have an idea and now I can bring it into the world as quickly as possible. That's not a way to make art. That's kind of a way to be an asshole, to be honest. <laughs> like, just like, oh, now all my, all my ideas will just happen. You'd be like, that's Elon Musk running Twitter. Like, that's stupid. You need checks. Like, you need pushback, right? That's a nice thing about an artwork is sometimes even, like, sometimes the material itself literally pushes back at you, like, as in, like, sculpting a piece of clay or something like that. But the really interesting thing that I saw there that also relates to AI and conceptual art and where you started us off with, Diana, about how all this stuff fits together is the devaluation of the image. And I agree with what Sarah said 100%. Like the images, the aesthetics of the artwork will basically not matter as anything except stating your like adherence to some sort of aesthetic tribe, right? There will be a tribe of people who like 3D blender kitsch style, and there will be a tribe of people who prefer a pixel art aesthetic or whatever. And so only as branding will aesthetics matter. And therefore, we need to find other expressive styles on which we will assess artworks. We know this to be true, right? Because when photography came around, this obviously posed a problem for realistic painting, all right? The criteria that we had used to assess the aesthetic quality of a piece all of a sudden becomes irrelevant because photographs can just do it. And, and, and like, like, like we know this, right? Like right away, Baudelaire was writing about this right away in like 1850s or like 1860, right? That uh, we kind of got to figure out new ways to paint, guys. This is going to be a problem. And you want to know what? We did. It was great. It is not a coincidence that that period like gives rise to impressionism, to capturing light in a way that a photographic emulsion cannot, right? And then it's like no surprise that then we move into abstraction, all right? Again, finding new aesthetic criteria. And so now it's not realism. It's not, it's not realistic representation that is under threat. Like it is all images. It's just like Sarah says, you have an image. It looks nice. Honestly, who cares? Like seriously, who cares? This is fairly simple to do. And I understand I'm very sympathetic to the fact that certain people who use AI do become better at, you know, using the prompts and they can fine tune it. And there certainly is some degree of craft and mastery to this, but that's a really fine distinction to make. It takes a very trained eye to recognize that. I have no confidence whatsoever that the general public will develop that level of distinction. So your images don't matter. So what still can matter? Well, there are a couple of things, and there's the way that we're going currently and the way that I hope that we go. The way that we're going currently is, okay, so if it is not the execution of the aesthetic argument itself, then it is the weight of the person who creates it. Right. Essentially, we like some things because they're made by X creator, Y creator, whatever. All the images are the same, but this one was made by like so and so with a 20 ETH floor and 400,000 followers on Twitter. Therefore, it is better. And so that's, you know, obviously the way that we're beginning to assess these works. Right. And it makes sense because it's very easy. I can easily look at a number to tell which artist is more important than the other. But I think that, you know, where you want it to go is for these artworks to begin to adopt conceptual arts criteria of what makes an artwork valuable or good, right? Is there original, like, thought behind this? Yes, this image exists, this artwork exists, but, like, what is the point of it? What is the story behind it? And ideally, that story is, like, unique and original and references something, I think, outside just the artists themselves. 
Yeah, I love that. All the talk about the image doesn't matter. You know, it's like all the other stuff that matters. That reminds me of I dug up an old Twitter thread that Mitchell, you were kind of like going back and forth with some people on. And so first of all, this was from back in May of 2021. Okay, just to set the stage. So this is like peak NFT days. Also like two years ago, Pranksy had posted when did Larva Labs, CryptoPunks get any utility or are we counting use as profile pick as utility? That solves a utility question for a lot of NFTs. And then people like Beanie and Punk4156 and people were responding to it. And basically the gist of it was Phantom Scribbler said, basically, if you buy art that you cannot see, then you're NGMI. <laughs> <laughs> so they're just like hating on art that you can't see, mm. aka like conceptual art or performance mm. art, which is what you guys specialize in. And Mitchell, you had this very long, like, like you responded with like a Twitter thread, which is, I think, kind of a power move. But you're basically talking about how A, that is not true and B, how blockchain can actually make, quote unquote, art you can't see more viable and more valuable. Can you talk about what you meant by that? Thank goodness I've done so many talks with Sarah at this point, because I can like crib her notes a little bit. But Sarah, one of the my, my favorite things that you've said when we've had a talk, because it's just it's so poignant, you, you, you basically said that, you know, painting is great because it packs flat. That's a Sarah Mayohas quote, okay? So I'm not going to take credit for it. But it's it's the art form that already comes in the best sale package. It's great. You know, this would be very easy for Ikea to, to sell it. But like, we've just spent however long talking about what I really like about art is art that connects me to an idea that I, I, I couldn't think of in any other way. Or it, or it puts this idea in the most perfect package, right? So let's go back to things that like, yes, they still have images, but those images are just barely faint. Like Sarah, like your stock piece, which is a thing that maybe not a lot of Web3 NFT people know about. Actually, can you tell us about that before I talk about how great it is? That'd be, that'd be Yeah, nice. please give that the people. TLDR about all the projects that you're talking about. Because I mean, I know it, we all know it, but some of our listeners might not be familiar. Yeah, that was a piece that I did right on the heels of Bitcoin. So I did a performance piece. It was January of 2016. And I was in a gallery, physically in it, at a desk. And every single day, I manipulated a stock that I found that had, you know, a thin order book. And I would pick stocks with funny names and manipulate it. And then at the end of the day, I would go up to a white canvas and with a thick black oil stick, very gesturally redraw, scribble the line that I had created on the market. That's what it was. And this was um, pre-meme stock fever. So I was also early to meme stock. <laughs> you were the original, you were the original Dogecoin before Dogecoin was a thing. Well, no, I took inspiration from Dogecoin, but back to Mitchell. So this is actually like one of my favorite pieces. And like, Sarah, I know, like I've told you this before, but it truly is. And it's one of my favorite pieces, despite like confession, I've never seen those drawings in person. Okay. I've never seen them in person. I best I've seen like documentation of like you standing in front of the drawing. Right. But it's because it's a beautiful idea. To me, it's the idea of like a person pissing into the ocean, but the ocean is global finance, right? Is, is this absolutely like futile attempt to leave a mark in a system that is so much bigger than you and completely indifferent to you, right? I love that. I think it's really beautiful. And I'm glad that the aesthetic thing of it exists, but that drawing, it's almost a token. Like it's almost a proof that like you did this one time. And I think that would be a stunning like artwork to own because to stand in front of these like these, these these markers of things that happen that make you think that you know turn your brain into a pretzel i think that's really exciting and so to bring it back to that tweet thread you were talking about right no like actually tokenization allows that all right the token can be the historical plaque that you put up and you say on this spot like this thing happened and the token is also unlike the historic plaque like it is ownable and transferable and it is you know a sense of ownership is 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 a magical thing and it creates a real sense of connection to this stuff now obviously if you're an artist you should put like a sort of at least minimum viable aesthetic component to it because that's a better antenna for channeling and picking up the energy that you put out there in that world. But like, again, it's not 
the primary thing. Like it is the like antenna that picks up the signals, the energy uh, that went into that process. Yeah. And you said too, with tokenization that artists don't need their artwork to be a commodity and can instead create whatever art they want, attach token to it and allow that commodity form to be completely separate. And that's kind of, you know, what we've seen through both of your works. Like I think IKB Digital Zones is maybe a good example of that too, Mm -hmm. where do you want to like very briefly explain that and how, you know, like you see the tokenization aspects, like making this quote unquote art you can't see a little bit more viable. And like, 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 you know, I I won't go too far into it because I, it's one of my favorite projects. It's one of my favorite projects. Just Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I do. And and I'm so happy. I, cause I, you know, when I get that from people that I respect, but let's no, let's plug your show. Cause you did a podcast with me where we had one of the best conversations about it. So go listen to that podcast and I'll talk about that project for like an hour. It's really good guys. It's like a really good project. And um, this was on the, yeah, that was on the Unstoppable podcast back in like, I think, September of 21 or something. You, you'll just have to Google it and find it. But it's like this, like, like Sarah, okay, actually, I won't put you on the spot for this. I'll just, I'll, I'll cop to something. I'll admit this myself as an artist working like sort of pre-tokenization. You have an idea. It's a really good idea. Like it would be a beautiful gesture, a beautiful intervention to do in a public space or whatever. And then inevitably as an artist, if you're a person who like cares about people seeing your work or like reading about it or heaven forbid, like paying your rent, I have to think about, okay, so now how do I make that something that I can put in a gallery and sell? All right. It's just like, okay, uh, I have this idea that I want to like, I don't know, like organized, like as a conceptual art piece, I'll, I'll try to shake the hand of every sanitation worker in New York City. You know, that, that, this was a real art project, by the way, that was like a very good project. All right. But then like, you have to think like, okay, but now like, what do I put in the museum and what do I sell? Is it like photographs of me shaking people's hands or whatever? You have to come up with a commodity form, right? And the token is so nice. And you, you, you have to do this if you want to be an artist, no matter how brilliant your idea is with the token form, it's really nice. It's a super convenient commodity form and it attaches to whatever you do. It attaches to whatever you do. All right, so if you do, if you want your art project to be shaking the hand of every sanitation worker in New York City, awesome, okay, you can attach a token to it. You should probably do another thing, like the token should maybe come, once again, with a photo of you doing that handshaking like you would have done in the previous world, but it could be other things. It, it, it could be other things. And that is what is exciting. There are also some physical materials that I know, Sarah, you've said kind of fall into that bucket of art you can't see, like almost non-existent. And I think one example that you've given is glass, especially in relation to computers. I think you said that glass exists simply not to exist. Yeah, well, that's my latest kick is glass, right? So I've been making holograms and I've been making diffraction gratings. They're both different forms of structural color. So light is refracting off of glass and either the glass is etched or it's got a silver halide emulsion on it and the light at a certain angle recruits a color. You've, Diana, you've seen the hologram in person. So what appeals to me about glass as a medium is, one, historically, it is so rich, right? The looking glass, you know, mirrors are glass, etc. Two, it is the interface that we use constantly without th- thinking about it with all with our computers and devices it is the architecture that surrounds us right all of the new buildings are all glass and then it's also just a super malleable material that can come in all these colors and do all these things and it drips and it like it's just an amazing material and it's also linked to optics right and how we see things so For all of those reasons combined, I'm just really fascinated to work with glass. And I'm interested in working with optics generally right now because, one, it puts you in your body when you stand in front of an artwork and something optical happens. It puts also space and time back together in the sense that as you move in space and in time, it's like the same Whereas now it feels like space and time can be just these separate things. And also the thing I've been thinking about, especially with 
generally AI, GPT-4, etc., we're creating new forms of intelligence that are going to surpass us, right? And I don't, I'm not a scientist and I don't totally understand things, but it seems like the structure of the brain is not unlike a neural net and like consciousness is basically an emergent property. It's not something that is just so inherent to us as humans. So there is like a decent chance that machines develop consciousness at some point. And our consciousness really has to do with our body. That's the thing. I know I'm not making a ton of sense here, but because we have eyeballs in sockets that we look out of, and that's how we understand the world because we have these bodies. That's why we're so, we can't imagine that like a machine might have consciousness because we are in our bodies. And so I'm interested in making artwork right now that really puts you back in your body, you know, puts you in your body. It doesn't make a ton, lot of sense, but I'm like just kind of getting to something around, around there. That's it's interesting a conversation, to think about. You yeah. know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. If you knew what it was going to be before you started, yeah. it'd be very boring. Yeah, but exactly. something like yeah, consciousness, I think, yeah, the border of what's life and what is not life is interesting. Interesting. Too. I'm I'm curious because both of you have experience working with like physical materials as well as, you know, something like IKB or something like non-existent token that has no physical component. I'm just curious, like what has been your experience working with like these different mediums? Like when do you feel inspired to start a project involving a physical medium versus like, you know, something a little less tangible. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious about that because I feel like for the most part, I see people either, artists either dabbling in the physical world or in the digital world. And you guys kind of straddle that line. For purely digital things, I feel like the narrative and the story and the concept is so much more important, right? Because the only thing that people are seeing is something small that they're experiencing on their phone, they're experiencing as an article about it. Like the article about the piece is part of the piece, you know? Whereas with a physical thing, there's so many other ways to act on someone's senses that the narrative doesn't have to be as, you know, as pointy, right? You can you can be making a piece that acts on somebody with scale, right? Because of its scale physically. So my physical pieces don't have as much of a story sometimes. I hadn't really figured out the perfect distinction, but that's a pretty good one. Yeah, we more sort of narrative, concise academic pieces, very good to be digital. You can have a lot more control over the context. In a digital piece, yeah, I know that somebody's like looking at it on a screen. Like there's honestly not that many ways that people can screw with it. Like I'm making work in video games right now so that I can have like the ultimate control over how people experience it, right? Like I'm controlling once you're in the screen, like if you're in one of my video games, like once you're in the screen, like you're mine. Like I determine which paths you can walk on, which objects are interactable, like what viewpoints. And out in the physical world, the notion that you can tell a self-contained story, a completed loop of an idea that's folly in the physical world. When I'm creating large physical pieces, and like a lot of the pieces that I've created are like big physical things that like weigh several tons and are like, you know, 12 feet tall and live in a pu public park, right? You know that drunken college kids like will urinate on it. And you know that the municipal authorities are going to hit it with the lawnmower whenever they do groundskeeping and stuff like that. The people will interact with it the wrong way. And so those pieces tend to be which is, I think, what Sarah was saying, more open-ended propositions. But it's cool, because like Sarah said, you get this different toolkit to work with. You can kind of affect feelings better in real life, and you can kind of affect the brain better in the digital world. Which is why, again, and I just want to put this out, just a little tip for the kids. Like, if you're making work about your feelings, like, physical world's a good place for you. Okay, interesting. How do you guys balance making work about your feelings or about your experiences with giving people what they want, which is a big thing that we talk about, like in the content space, maybe not, maybe artists don't care about that. Like, do you guys care or think about that 
at all? Like, oh, people really like, have you ever made a piece that you were like, this isn't my best work or this isn't my favorite work, but it's what gets the most traction from people? There is nothing that I will be more proud of in my career than that like 10 plus years that I spent eking out like a, a, a good living, like for my family by being a sort of like mid-career artist. You know, that's, I'm, I'm extremely proud of that because that's like, it's not luck. All right. That's like, you just, you have to grind, right? And you grind for it and maybe it happens and like, maybe you get picked and you become a star, but probably you don't, right? But if you had that for 10 years and you, you worked your, you worked your butt off. And with that comes like, you know, you take commissions, you do commercial work and, and sometimes like that stuff happens and I don't hold it against anybody who has to sometimes compromise on that whenever they're trying to eke out a living as a mid-career artist for 10 years. So that's fine. And so, yeah, yeah, I've, I've been in moments like that where it was more about traction with whoever writes the checks, right? Now we're in this point where the market writes the checks. So do you cater the artwork for the market? Now look, the side effect of having spent 10 years, like, like 10 years grinding, making the best work that I could whenever I could, and, you know, making work for myself when I could, but also having to face the reality that sometimes I had to make art not for myself, is that, you know, now to be in the position where I'm at now, where to be like very clear, I'm extremely fortunate. I mean, like, I'm, I'm just ex extremely fortunate because I have a group of collectors who I feel like support me and who can feel, you know, confident will, will support the next work. It means that I, I, I don't have to do that. So again, I throw like no shade at people who have to create work for the market. I think that like, if you're already hugely successful and you're making work for the market, then you're just, I don't know, just probably not a person I'm interested in hanging out with. Like, you know, but if you're, you know, not yet at that point where you've sort of escaped gravity, you know, I get it. But for me, like, yeah, not having to worry about that stuff is a privilege. And I like, I, I make the work for myself and I get to enjoy every step of the process. And that's just kind of how I take it on. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely made some pieces because I just knew that there'd be more of a market for them. But that then didn't feel like, a, oh, I'm just doing this, you know, because it then forced me to revisit something and push it further. And yeah, I kind of just make work for myself and I am a bit crazy. It's not a rational, it's not a, being an artist is not a rational employment or form of employment. And even when things look like they're really successful, it's like, it's a, sh it's like can be really expensive to make some of the projects that I want to make. And like nobody really real, like, or people don't totally realize, or if they do realize, like buying my photographs is like a great way to support my practice because that's an easier thing for me to make and sell than making a video piece, right? That like only a museum is going to buy, but then you get to have a piece that connects you to like the overall practice, right? But I wouldn't, not make the video piece, right? And just make photographs because the photographs sell better than, you know, <laughs> a video piece. <laughs> so that's the, that's kind of the trade-off. The other trade-off is that since I like to touch different mediums a lot, there are really pros and cons to that. The pro is that it's pretty interesting. The con is that there are many failed experiments that you don't see. And all of those failed experiments are a mixture of time, right? Of time and money. And so you just don't see that there's like 10 failed experiments before you get to holograms, right? But, you know, that's part of the, it's part of the process. Like, like, let me put this another way and I'll even like frame this with an anecdote, right? So like a couple weeks ago, somebody messages me to say, hey, like, are you going to mint some artwork on ordinals? Like, you know, artwork, mint some artwork on, 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 on Bitcoin. And I was like, why would I? Like, why would I do that? And it's just like what this person doesn't want to say, but like the only reason was because people were buying stuff there. If I can, you know, be able to make some sort of claim, I'm the 57th artist ever to mint on ordinals. And I'm actually the first conceptual Asian Canadian artist to mint on ordinals. Like, it's just like, give me a break. Like, you know, I had this long conversation about why, like, I would never do that because I don't really have a good, re I don't have an idea that needs to be expressed in four megabytes on the Bitcoin blockchain. Like, that's just not a fit with any of my ideas. If I thought about it, maybe I could come up with a smart reason, but like, 
not not going to come up with something smart two weeks after people start buying this stuff for all that money. Like, I think that that's really bogus. I think it's really gross. I honestly like, look, I do like, I, I think the people who do that are gross. I'll, I'll just say it. I'll say this is what I think is cool because I don't want to be like too preachy or act holier than thou about a relationship with the market. But if you can afford to do this, this is a really cool thing to do, which is that you can, you know, make the things that you want to make because you're passionate about it because you think that they're good ideas. And then you can wait for the market to exist or you can make the work and then make the market and like make the market for the work. That's, that's cool. That's a cool thing to do. If you're a real, if you're like a good artist and also like a smart, it's such a, you know, business genius, do that. Right. And so you look what happened, right? Sarah makes Bitcoin, right? Or I make IKB at a time. Was there a market for it? No, there was no market for this. Nobody was buying this stuff. It was fine. And actually that was even better because when we crew, because, you know, when I created IKB, it was purely just everything about it was tailored to what was the best expression of the idea. Okay. What collectors would like wasn't even a, a consideration. In fact, I did a lot of things that work to make it specifically difficult to buy. And I kept all that stuff. And then, you know, a market for it sort of popped up. Okay. And that's, and again, Stroke of luck, huge luck. That's a once in a lifetime, like winning the lottery for me. That didn't have to happen. So I'm, I'm hugely fortunate. Right now I'm like making video games. Is there an artwork for art for like artworks inside video games that are NFTs? Hell no. Like there's, there's no market for that. Like, but you know, but I think that's a really exciting way to make art, you know? And so what I will do, and I'll be honest, because I don't want to act holier than thou, like, oh, the market doesn't matter for me. It's total nonsense. No, but I can put the artwork first. And then when it's done, I will put work into creating a market for that work. I will, I will do whatever dumb Twitter shill threads I need to do. And, and then that's, and that'll happen. And that's, a, that's a kind of a cool way to do things. Yeah, what are like the best ways you guys have found to market your work, create the market for your work, as you say? I think that there's no substitute for just being present, right? You have to be pre like, we're doing this podcast, right? Like, you know, we've seen each other around. You can't kind of stay in your in your shell and, and not share with people. And interestingly... The, the myth of the artist as the like lone genius who's sort of outside, this is such a, it's such a myth, right? When you look, when you even go back hundreds of years, all of the biggest artists, like even the Renaissance, right? I was reading like Leonardo da Vinci's biography and Michelangelo, all of them were just in the court, like, you know, like talking to the patrons, you know, around, they were just they were in in the hot spot so you just have to be present that's what i found what about you mitchell twitter show I realize we're actually kind of a boring dual interview because we agree on stuff too much <laughs> 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 well, it's true right like, <laughs> well, like like yeah what she said like like you know you, you, you'd be around you'd be authentic i'm you know i'm fortunate i have like a, basically like a small collector base i have like you know genuine legitimate relationships with a good number of them and that's not just a nice like business for me but that's like actually that's kind of a nice that's a nice life for me i'm, I'm quite happy so mitchell we have very this is a difference like mm -hmm. the people who have bought my work at mm -hmm. the the kind of higher priced things mm -hmm. are people that i don't have relationships with right right both also in crypto as well like mm -hmm. the people who bought kind of at the phillips auction there's like one mm -hmm. that i'm friends with which is just kind of interesting and I don't I don't mind it. It's always somewhat surprising, but it's actually people who don't really know me socially or who have any interest mm -hmm. also in getting to know me socially. Okay, I was going to ask are you guys not friends because you don't vibe or because they've just never no. shown their identity to you and they you have just, no idea who they are. Like some of them I know, but it's like they're not interested in being my friend. They're like interested mm -hmm. in collecting my artwork and not oh. and not being my friend which is fascinating and i kind of appreciate because it's like then you're not just buying something because i'm friendly right yeah. and it also has allowed me to not um you know because there's always as an artist and mitchell will know this is like if mitchell and i were going to every nft conference and walking around and saying hi to everybody like that might 
be good for sales, but we would get nothing done in terms of <laughs> creating. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, so you really have to balance how much you're giving to the community in terms of your presence and your time and showing up to events and how much you're spending actually making. And so the one thing that's been really nice about having collectors who, and I mean, like, you know, Mitch, I'm not implying that you're having dinner with your collectors every week, but, but having this, this sort of more distant relationship is actually something I kind of appreciate because it's like, if this is the pattern for me, right, mm -hmm. then I can just focus on doing the work and not have to focus on, you know, hanging out. So, yeah, but I think it changes. I think it's different and it changes and yeah. So I don't it's know, but it's, 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 yeah, it's, I mean, probably part of it too is like a personality thing. Cause Mitchell, you're just like very outgoing and, friendly so and Sarah. I am outgoing and friendly too. Yes. Yeah, so so are I, you, Sarah. This is, this, is but I this, mean, this is devastating. I'm 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 here to let people know <laughs> that Sarah Mayo has social token up a huge up only potential. <laughs> yeah, no I will uh, you know. <laughs> Okay, uh we gotta wrap up soon, but I want to hear about what you guys are working on right now. Yeah. Mitchell, I know it's your video game, Beggar's Belief. And mm -hmm. I don't know very much about it. So I want to hear about that. And then Sarah, I know you're working on your holograms, but I feel like you've always got a few things up your sleeve. So I'd love to hear about what you're working on too. So whoever wants to go first. Okay, okay, sure. So, yeah, you know, as I've alluded to a few times, right, I'm interested in, you know, interactive artworks, um, video game artworks. I just think that there are so many mechanics in video games, so many things that video games can do that can be exploited to tell, you know, art ideas, right, to tell art narratives. And so everything I'm working on right now is a video game. They're all sort of a series. The first series was called Winslow Homer's Croquet Challenge, and it was commissioned by the Buffalo AKG Art Museum, and that came out back in December. The next thing that I'm working on that should be out this summer is a video game called The Boys of Summer. And this is essentially a baseball character creator RPG, and it is also a PFP collection. And users will use their PFPs um, and plug them into the game to assign various like, like metadata and statistics to the game. And the artwork is about the sort of like gamification of a finance, the sort of money ballification of like all aspects of our lives in terms of how we are really leaning into this idea of like the quantified life and how PFP culture is an expression of that, right? PFP culture is to me very indicative of the way that like the way we want to present ourselves to other people online is as a collection of traits, which are more or less rare and valuable. And so bringing together all these ideas about the quantified life, about like uh, the financialization of like and quantification of like sentiment and PFP culture is um, this project that'll be out in the summer. Yeah, I'm working on a few things. So I'm doing an exhibition that opens May 17th at Marian Boski Gallery in New York that will be up for six weeks that anybody can come visit. And that will feature some holograms. So one hologram that I've been working on for a long time is 14 foot piece and it's a female nude with plants all cut up like kind of like a deconstructed you know nude as um so all shards individual shards on the wall so that's one really big piece and then more pieces that are holograms around the body and then a diffraction grading piece where the glass is etched between two and three thousand lines per millimeter and creates like very intense structural color and that also features nudes um it's interesting i've been kind of going to the sort of nude body as a material and it's mostly um it's like i was started with plants but I'm kind of, it's like the equivalent. We're like all, it's like life on earth, right? <laughs> and uh, so I'm, yeah, so I'm holograms of nudes is definitely one thing. And then I'm making these AI glass eyeballs, which are basically like light sculptures that have, that have like a Fresnel lens. So they have an optical effect. And there are these AI eyes that are kind of eye jellyfish eyes that I'm creating too, that are kind of looking at you, the whole AI, an eye reflection of, you know, 
the kind of decentralized intelligence, this type of illusion. So that's that's the show. And then I have a script that I wrote that's an adaptation of the myth of Medusa set in the perfume industry. And so I'm starting to package that, which means like figuring out who the French co-production company is and who the cast is and talking to investors. And so putting that movie together. And that's a project I've been working on for years. And and then I'm experimenting. I'm definitely have some stuff cooking in a more experimental way with like stuff like ferrofluid and other <laughs> funny things and maybe can link it to something on chain. The stuff on chain is like taking a bit of a slow, you know, the market's really down. So a slower a- approach. But um, but the fun news was that Bitcoin and Cloud of Petals got acquired by the Pompidou. And so I'll be speaking there in early April. Uh, and yeah, so it's a it's a mix of things. But even with the movie, it's interesting because, like, you know, I can drop film stills to all Bitcoin holders or something like that, right? You know, like, there, the kind of link to crypto can exist um, in so many ways, which is great. So, yeah, so that's kind of the... So cool. Yeah. How do you work on so many projects at once? Yeah, I want to know I'm that too. Alone. I'm not alone. Uh, and so, and it's funny because I was joking, like I just did a shoot for W magazine and they're going to release it. And it was just me. Like, and I was like, this is a lie. It's not just me. Right. Like there, I have close collaborators who work with me on all the parts of this. Right. Uh, so that's, that's the reality. Still, though, like, so cool. I feel like my brain would just explode trying to, like, constantly think about, like, all these different projects and bounce back and forth between these projects at the same time. But maybe that's just me. They're all really slow. (laughs) And really amazing when you see them. The Um, hologram, honestly, I was so blown away when I saw your hologram at Basel because walking up to it, I think I was with Gay, or no, I was with... um, Shoot, I forget his name. Who's the other guy that works? Evil? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was like, oh, you got to come see this hologram. And walking up to it, it kind of just looks like a glass, you know, like. Piece cool. of glass. Yeah, a piece of glass. Like, it looks cool. But I had no idea, like, what was coming. <laughs> and then when he brought me up and was like, okay, now, like, slowly move around it. I was just like mind blown blown away i think i had to tiptoe a little bit too because i'm on the shorter side of things yeah and it just, the holograms yeah. i feel like i just hit my stride with holograms as a medium because one right you know you have to stand in front of it two it makes reference to augmented reality it is augmented reality but in a completely analog way and um three it like feels like stained glass right the colors are brilliant uh and now I think that for some of the future, for, for the previous holograms, I've really, I shot things, right, photographically. I make stereograms functionally for some of them. For some of them, you make them, the Bitcoin holograms I had made, you make it from a physical item. But I think that for a next iteration, and I just have to find the right collaborator for this, this is where I always need collaborators for everything, is I want to make some where I'm coming up with the imagery digitally, right? So like, I want, you know, the last shoot that I did, and I'm not sure it came out so well, I had, like, these droplets of water hanging from eyelashes, okay? But now I'm thinking, like, digitally, I could have droplets of water with images reflected in them, and I just need a sh- 90 frames in a very particular way. Like, so should I come up with, hol- like, scenes digitally just for the purpose of putting them in a hologram? But wow, finding the right collaborator is the next step. Wow. Thank you so much, Sarah and Mitchell, who dropped. But thank you both so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. Thank you, listeners, for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us out a lot. And we will be back again next Thursday with another episode of Rehash. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Rehash. Rehash is hosted by Diana Chen, produced and edited by Ellie Dots and Tyler Internet, and sponsored by Lens, Empire Wallet, and NFT.Storage. Rehash is also
also supported by Rehash DAO, a community of NFT holders who curate our guest lineup each season. To get involved, head over to our website at rehashweb3.xyz and collect this episode as an NFT. Anyone who collects an episode becomes a part of Rehash DAO and will be able to nominate guests for future seasons. Voting rights are reserved for our guests, sponsors, and OG crowdfund supporters. And to learn more about how to become a guest or sponsor, go to rehashweb3.xyz slash podcast. Finally, be sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at Rehash Web 3 or on Lens at rehash.lens. <laughs>